everyone. We have an incredible show today. We are on board the SS John W. Brown, and we have Mike Schneider. Again, what's your role on the show? I uh, sail in the uh, engine department. I sail as a fireman, water tender, or oiler. Right. And you are? Andrew Smith. And what do you do with the ship? I'm a deckhand, um, sailing as an OS, as well as uh, serving as an admin support officer. All right. Now, I have a special guest. This is a gentleman who served the United States uh, military in the Army's Navy. Your name? <laughs> Saul Solomon. I, hey, served, you, you served, I served from 1948 to 1951 during the Korean War. All right. And, of course, I happen to know him a long time, probably since the day I was born. Okay, that's my pop. All right, and you are Andrea. Hi, my name is Andrea. I am staff on the ship, and I serve for the social media and the website and post pictures. All right, so let's go with social media first, because if people want to learn more about the ship, where do they go on the web and Facebook and all those great places? SSJohnWBrown.org, and we're on Facebook, uh, John w- SS John W. Brown Project Liberty Ship. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram also. Right. Now, they had these things back in World War II, right? <laughs> of course they did. Right. They, had, they put everything on the cloud. <laughs> all right. So who, who can give me the, the background of the, of the vessel? For, okay, Mike. That would be Mike. All right, Mike. So tell us about this, this, this incredible piece of history. John W. Brown was one of 2,710 nearly identical Liberty-class cargo vessels built during the war as part of the emergency shipbuilding program. She made several voyages during and immediately after the war. In 1946, uh, she was surplus, or we had more ships than we had cargo, and the vessel was loaned to the Board of Education City of New York. It's served in the City of New York uh, Board of Education as a... uh, facility for a vocational high school teaching the maritime trades. So hundreds, literally thousands of students went to school, went to high school on this ship during that period. They gave up the ship in 1982. It had a, uh, about a five-year layover in the uh, reserve fleet before we acquired it. Uh, Project Liberty Ship, which is a nonprofit organization, all volunteers acquired the ship in 1988. Uh, we towed it to Baltimore. We spent three years restoring it to the point that it would operate, and we have been sailing it ever since. So since 1991, on our first voyage, we've steamed over 25,000 miles. We have visited 29 ports in the United States and Canada outside the Chesapeake Bay, and here we're back in New York for the uh, second voyage, a second visit we've made here since restoration, and of course, we made several visits here during the war. Wow. So let me talk a little bit about sort of like, like the, where was the ship built and was it, was it cargo only or was it cargo and transport? And one of the questions that I had was, what was used to protect the ship while it was at sea from submarine attack and, and aircraft attack and things like that, since obviously supply is always attacked by the opposition? The uh, ship was built in Baltimore at the Bethlehem Fairfield shipyard. Bethlehem, as part of Bethlehem Steel Fairfield, was the uh, location they built. 384 Liberty ships, more than any other shipyard. Uh, The ship was built as a five-hatch dry cargo ship back in the the wartime era, before the days of containers. Cargo was all handled essentially piecemeal, crates, drums, boxes, vehicles, that type of thing. And she carried those kinds of uh, cargoes after the first voyage, which is a uh, voyage to the Persian Gulf carrying war material to Russia, She came back to New York City and was modified to be what they called a limited-capacity troop transport. They took a portion of the cargo spaces on what we call the tween deck forward of the engine room and converted it to carry 500 troops. So from that time on, she could carry troops and cargo, and the idea was that if you had a full military unit, perhaps a couple of company-sized Units, you could take all their personnel, all their logistics, artillery, vehicles on the same ship. And it was particularly helpful as the front moved across North Africa to Sicily, to Italy, to southern France. You could move 
fresh military units forward, bring the other military units back for a rest. What was done when, when the ships were on the ocean? Were they in some kind of configuration? The wartime voyages were made, in, for the most part, in, in, in convoy. There was an exception on the, the first cruise of John W. Brown when she was in the Pacific Ocean and Indian Ocean. She sailed alone, but virtually uh, all the cargo ships sailed in convoy uh, so that they had the pool of their defensive armament against air attack, and they were escorted by naval vessels to uh, protect them from submarines and air attack. Okay. Now, were the were the was the vessels the the, the the Liberty ships were they the subject of attack by opposition forces? Oh, they certainly were because um, the one of the things the Nazi regime was trying to do was to starve England and get England out of the war. So everything that England needed to subsist were were carried by by ships as well as all the military cargo that was being carried over there to be. Uh, Landed across the Channel in uh, 1944. When they when they carried cargo, how much cargo was actually able? How much how much was it able to hold? Like one ship like this, the uh, rated capacity of a Liberty ship was 10,800 dead weight tons. That's a measure of the carrying capacity. So the cargo and fuel would weigh 10,800 tons, and that was equivalent of about 300 World War II era boxcars worth of cargo. Now, when it's fueled up, what is the capacity of the fuel, and how long would it take before you need to be refueled? The uh, fuel capacity was a little over 500,000 gallons. Uh, 500,000 gallons, wow. <laughs> and it was enough uh, fuel to sail probably uh, twelve to 15,000 miles, depending on the speed that you were going. But uh, you could cross the ocean easily and of course, the first voyage took it all the way to the Persian Gulf with, wow. with one pit stop in uh, Cape Town. And, and how long would like, things like food supplies last? Well, you would hope they would last the, <laughs> the full voyage. I think they... Did you stop at the Quickie Mart <laughs> in the middle of the ocean for a re, re, restock? Yeah, no, the Quickie Mart was out or they were on the submarine alert or something. But uh, the fresh produce and, and milk would run out fairly quickly, so you were subsisting on canned and frozen things for the most part. Right. Did they, in World War II, did they use anything like helicopters to resupply any of the vessels, or that wasn't technologically available at the time? I don't think that there was helicopter resupply during, uh, <laughs> during World War II. Of course, the merchant ships didn't have the capability to do any resupply while they were underway. Uh, what, would, what, what would be the configuration of the crew? Uh, what would be a full crew? The uh, Coast Guard, who oversees the merchant uh, fleet, uh, required 44 merchant seamen on here between the deck department, engine department, and stewards department, and that remains the requirement today. We have to have 44 either licensed or documented uh, seamen aboard the vessel to operate it. Uh, now, to jump over, how do you get 44 people now to volunteer to just sail around? Because, you know, they, I don't know if there's a big supply around. Uh, we don't have any problem with volunteers because we have an awful lot of people that work on the ship, and when the ship gets underway, they want to sail with us as, as part of the operating crew. The uh, thing that is becoming a little bit more difficult today is to maintain the required Coast Guard documentation, which requires training and requires sea time and which has other requirements, and that's becoming more and more difficult to, uh, to find those kinds of people. But we do have. I guess because of all the regulations throughout the United States, the OSHA, and all the other things that uh, come, aboard, come about, require more, much more difficulty to get the uh, the amount of qualified personnel. At that, that's true. It's it's mainly the International Maritime Organization and the. Um, the, uh, the, the uh, agreements that we sign on to to say our merchant marine is, is, is going to uh, comply with them. There is more and more training required for people these days than there was during the wartime era when everything was kind of expediency to, to get the cargo to the other side where it could be used. Yeah, I'm sure the medical exam with those days were cough. Good, you're, you're hired. <laughs> I'm sure they didn't check blood type, right? They were just, you're good to go. Um, 
Tell us a little bit about the configuration of the ship. How many how many decks are there? What's where? How many people? Where, where did the crew stay? And, and tell us a little about the wardroom that we're in. Okay, it was a five hatch dry cargo ship. There were three cargo holds forward of the midship accommodation house, which we are sitting in now. There were two holds aft of that. There are three decks in the accommodation plus a, a flying bridge. So we're on the main deck, which is where the unlicensed crew lives where the galley is where the food is prepared where the uh, officers and the crew eat on the next level which is called the boat deck because the lifeboats are located there the officers are housed on the deck above that called the bridge deck the master and the radio operator have cabins along with the radio room and the wheelhouse and then on top of that is what we call the open bridge or the flying bridge where frequently the ship is operated from because the best visibility occurs up there. During World War II, what would you say the travel time was, say, between, say, New York and, and Great Britain? Uh, convoy speed across the Atlantic in the early part of the right. war was eight knots, and that's not very fast. It's about 10 miles per hour, a little less than that, and it was that low because most of the ships in those early wartime convoys had been built for World War I. So they were slower ships, and that's the best they could do. When a Liberty ship was built, it would go about 10 knots, 10 or 11 knots, and uh, that was fine for keeping up and maintaining station in an eight-knot convoy. The time to cross the ocean was a little bit dependent on the convoy route and the weather, but generally uh, two, two and a half weeks to get from the U.S. Yeah. To, uh, to England. Uh, so when you think about it, two and a half weeks is an incredibly long time in a war, you know? Because if you need things, you're, you're sitting on the other side just waiting. Uh, that, is, that is true. But if you look at the convoy records uh, across the North Atlantic, there were 355 convoys during the course of the war years. Now, that started in 39 when Europe entered the war. But um, there was a convoy going across the North Atlantic that left about every three days on average. So there were a lot of ships en route at any one time. What is the length and the width of the ship? The ship is 441 feet and 6 inches long. The breadth is 58 feet, and when she is fully loaded, it draws uh, 27 feet 9 inches of water. Now, you talked about the 500,000 gallons of fuel. What kind of fuel did it use then, and do you still use the same kind of fuel today? When the ship was built, it burned a heavy grade of bunker oil, which was called Bunker C. It was very heavy. It had to be heated before it could even be pumped. It was so sludgy? To achieve the viscosity. And then it had to be heated again before it could be atomized and burned. Uh, we have uh, converted to burn a distillate fuel. We burn number two marine diesel oil now, which is a lot cleaner. It's a lot easier on the, uh, on the firemen and on the uh, environment. And do you have... The same en- do, you have, do you still have the same boilers and engine equipment as you did back then, or was it slightly modified? No, no modifications on the, uh, on the engineering plant other than the change to distillate fuel. We had to do a lot of boiler repairs to get them uh, running again. Uh, conversely, we had to do very, very little with the engine. So the engine has run for 74 years with very little maintenance. The boiler has, boilers have taken a bit, a bit more to maintain them, but it's... Was the fuel uh, equivalent to the number six oil that uh, was recently re- outlawed in New York? I don't know about three out there in other states. Yeah, B- Bunker C was number six fuel oil, yes. Now, what, what kind of ships did you start sailing on, and when was that more or less? Me, me you, personally? Me personally, yeah. Uh, I went in the Navy uh, after... Uh, going to Merchant Marine Academy, so I sailed on uh, surface ships, I sailed on diesel submarines, I had command of a frigate. Wow. You went to the Merchant Marine Academy in Kings Point, New York? I did. Oh, wow, because we lived not that far from there, and that's, that's not too far from the station. Well, the other one was in Sheepshead Bay. The other Merchant Marine Academy, there was one in Kings Point and one in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn. Okay. And Sheepshead Bay taught the, uh, the unlicensed crew. Uh, so those, those courses were cheap side bay, but most, uh, I think virtually most of the uh, World War II unlicensed crew came out of sheep side bay. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, so what is the experience aboard this vessel 
compared to your experiences in the Navy? You know, in terms of just, you know, is it, is it like really different? Is it the same but different? You know, is it, this is just sort of like, a, you know, driving in like, an, like a 1960 Impala, you know, in, 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 you know, the modern era. Like, what is it like? I, I think being on a merchant ship and a Navy ship are completely different. Navy ship, a lot of discipline. Um, everybody is in uniform, very clear rank structure. You come on something like John W. Brown where it's all volunteers, there is still the rank structure, but it is a, a lot less formal. And you're here because you're a volunteer. Uh, leading a volunteer crew is a little bit different than leading a military crew. I don't have to go into any detail on that, I'm sure. The, the, the one consistency that I see, and which is the biggest reward for me, is the, the camaraderie among the, um, among the crew. You take an all-volunteer crew who is here to preserve and operate this ship, here, they're here because they want to be. If there's anybody who has a grudge or becomes disgruntled, they go away, leaving only the people who, who want to be here and are happy to be here working with others. So the, the camaraderie... Uh, among Navy crews, particularly submarine crews, and on John W. Brown are the, are the highlights, and, and they are similar in that regard. How's the chow? How's the chow on this, this vessel? <laughs> I, I think it's very, very good, and you have probably already heard that the uh, chief cook on here is a fellow by the name of Joe Brown who went to high school on John W. Brown and learned the culinary skills going to the John W. Brown as a vocational high school. So it's kind of interesting that some... I don't know, 40 or 50 years later, he's back. Back home. <laughs> back, back, back home feeding the crew rather than learning about feeding. So um, when you're sailing around now, uh, what is it like? Is, there, is it port to port to port or is it port to port stop, you know, repairs, training, and, and then continue? Like what is it, what's the rhythm? It's, it's a very slow rhythm. We spend most of our time in, in Baltimore, and we conduct what we call these six-hour living history cruises as a fundraising activity and to show people what it was like to be on a merchant ship in 1944. Uh, we have, in the past, tried once a year, at least once a year, to get outside of Chesapeake Bay to visit another port. And as the price of fuel has gone up and has other, some other factors has made it more and more difficult. So this year we visited Norfolk, which of course is in Chesapeake Bay, and then we got back to uh, New York. So most of the time the ship is tied up alongside the pier in, in Baltimore. So for people in the Baltimore area, where would they go to visit the vessel? The ship is moored at uh, Pier 1 South Clinton Street in the Canton section of Baltimore. The volunteers work on Wednesdays and Saturdays. The ship is open on those days. People are welcome to come aboard and uh, look around while the volunteers are aboard. All right. So, wait, Andrew, so um, for people down in Baltimore, is there special contact information, phone numbers, websites? It's all uh, on the website, ssjohnwbrown.org. All right. And then um, is there anything that's special down there that people can do or participate or in terms of social media, the selfies with the crew or anything like that or... Well, we do. We work with a lot of local photographers, so we have meetups. They'll be able to come on board with their tripods and take long exposures, get down into the engine room, and and then we share. We do blogs on the website, so we can share things that people have taken. And we've already been um, we've been uh, contacted by photographers here in New York who've taken pictures of us going under the Verrazano and going under the Brooklyn Bridge, and they've been sharing pictures with us. So. Yeah. Another thing is with the high co cost of fuel that you can't travel as much. What are the cost of pier docking? Does New York City charge you? And, and, and or did they come by and give you parking tickets if you overstay? <laughs> I, I was not involved in that, and I can't answer that. So I'm going to I'm going to defer that one to somebody else. Frequently, when we go to a port visit, there is a um, pier that's specifically used for visiting visiting historic no ships, charge. and there is no charge. Uh, I don't know the arrangements in New York. I was not part of that, so I can't comment on that. Oh, I thought I asked. That's why, because New York looks for every dollar it can get. <laughs> if you get a parking ticket, I'll help you out. <laughs> I know in the arrangement of this trip, one comment was we were trying to get something done, and one comment was, I'm sure that you're proud of your nice little museum ship, but this is New York. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of Nice. This is Richard Solomon. You're listening to Taking Care of Business. We're aboard the SS John W. Brown at Pier 36 in New York. We'll be right back. You are listening to Taking Care of Business on 88.1 WCWP. 
WCWP.org and TCDRadio.com. Welcome back. This is Richard Solomon aboard the SS John W. Brown at Pier 36 in New York. And I have Andrew, my father, Andrea, and Joe Brown. And Joe Brown. Now, apparently you're the most liked guy on the ship. <laughs> well, I like to think so. And the most needed. Uh, I, I, I'd like to think that too. <laughs> All right. So tell, me, tell us about your history aboard this vessel. I came aboard in 59 as a student, high school student. And I graduated. I went to sea for 11 years. And then I went to work for Con Ed. And I worked for Con Ed for 26 years. Con Ed in New York, right here on like 14th Street? No, I was upstate New York. I was in the power plants. Okay. And um, I retired in 05, and I went to work at the court system. I did that for 11 years. I'm an attorney. What'd you do? I was court officer. Oh, no kidding. Which, which, which one? In the town of Mamacaden. Okay, because I'm always in Brooklyn Supreme, Queen Supreme, uh, New York Supreme, so, yeah, I, I have my OCA card. <laughs> after, after a finish, I'll show you my card so I you know, I'm, you can show I'm uh, legit. <laughs> you know, that's all right. This is very informal over here. You know, ba- back in the day, I don't, I don't believe they had cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> no, they didn't. Um, so anyway, you, were saying you, were, you were a court officer, and then after that? After that, it's here. All right. So ha- how did you get reinvolved? Okay. And uh, I was working uh, the 4 to 12 shift, and I came home from work, and I was looking at a documentary on TV, and they were showing the ship coming through the locks. And I said to my, woke my wife up, and I told her, that was my high school. <laughs> that was my high school floating by. He told me that I should go to sleep. <laughs> and she didn't believe me. And that next weekend, I came down to Baltimore because on the documentary it said it was docked in Baltimore. And so I came down to Baltimore and I found it. So I've been very active since '02. Wow. After I retired from Con Edison, I, I didn't miss any cruises. I'll make all the cruises. Wow. And now, now what, what do you do day to day on the vessel when you're either at dock or when you're on, on at sea? I, you know, I cook. I do, I do a lot of the cooking. Um, this trip here, they, I'm the chief steward. Next trip, I might be chief cook. Yeah. So, so before you take off, do you go to like one of those big stores and just have the biggest shopping cart out there and load up? <laughs> BJ's. We load up at BJ's in Baltimore. There. Did they give you? A, did, did they give you a break on the membership fee? <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't give you a break on nothing. <laughs> well, we'll lend you. We'll lend you our card next time. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so if you're going to go. On a on a trip, how much food, either in terms of volume or whatever, do you need to sustain? You know, the the, the uh, adequate I, inventory. I think this trip here, we might have spent close to ten thousand. Right, but 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 you know, I, I don't know. I, I get a little bag, and it's like a hundred bucks. So I mean, you know, how much volume is that? Oh, that's a lot of volume. What we we took on um, fifty cases of eggs. Um, I think 60, 60 pounds of bacon, 60 pounds of sausage, uh, bread. We took on uh, probably 100 loaves of bread, rye, wheat, white. Do you have to freeze the bread to keep it fresh? No. no. We use it up and because it mildews fast on here. So we, we buy bread when we, get, when we got here. And uh, we buy our desserts. Uh, Unless we have a baker. I, we used to have a very good baker, but he stopped coming. Oh, so. I got to uh, <laughs> reach it. So they got to go to BJ's. <laughs> so what do you like to cook and what are the faves? What are, like, like when, when, what, what's the thing? What, what, are, what are the doorbuster foods? What, Andrew, what's the door, what are the doorbuster foods for you? Um, Joe's really good with soups. 
and it, that's something that's always a treat because most of the time we're working here uh, it's during the winter those are our strongest work months because we're out of our cruising cycle so the soups are a nice treat because you come in while it's chilly outside and he's got a soup sitting there ready for you and it it makes it easy um i'll defer there are a couple of nice. and- andrew seems to have our favorite food here we go Joe's really, really good at when when stores get a little low, coming up with things. So he likes he like like, like bacon soup <laughs> with breadcrumbs. No, it's always delicious. It's always delicious. That's where he takes. I guess he looks to improvise yes. with what's available. He's great at that. He's really, really great at that. All right, let me ask my father a question. When you were on the FS two two one, what was the food like when you were aboard? Very good, very good, because we bought our own food as well, and we didn't depend on it. We went to the commissary to pick up the food, but the skipper made sure he had whatever he was good for everybody. Right. And for you, what were the favorite foods? Do you remember anything that was like... No, you know? Nothing special. Everything was good. Better than the chow in the, in the, in the barracks when I was in the barracks. <laughs> All right. So, 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 I, I I was just aboard the USS Bataan, and they had these sixty kettle, sixty gallon kettle uh, drums, and you see them making hamburgers for you know. I mean, the crew's like there's like two thousand people aboard. Um, how long does it take to prep the food? How long does it take to cook the food? Uh, I mean, there's, there's, it's got to be normally for breakfast. I start at. 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning and we start serving breakfast at 6.30 we from 6.30 to 8. Lunch we start at 11.30 and we serve lunch from 11.30 to 1. And then dinner, we serve dinner from 5 until whatever we finish up. What other? Any late night snacks? Yeah. All, <laughs> all, all, all the time we have late night snacks. So we have what they call night lunch here. Okay. Now, what's the favorite? Uh, what's the favorite snack? I know that um, on the Bataan, it was like um, these like uh, cereal bars. They were all over the place. What, what's the what's the the snack food of choice here? Usually, it's sandwiches, ham sandwiches, roast beef sandwiches, yeah, and uh, potato chips. We put out potato chips, fresh fruit, and uh, we try to keep them mixed up. Yeah, you know, trying to give them some uh, assortment. So does anyone ever come up aside a, a, a and say, pardon me, but do you have any gray poupon? Because <laughs> you might, you know. <laughs> salad dressings, you have people come up and say, oh, gee, you, do you have this kind of salad dressing or that kind of salad dressing? Mm-hmm. Then next time, I usually that's what I usually end up buying some. Yeah. Now, now, when you guys visit a place like New York, do you, do you ever get any dignitaries like the mayor or the governor to come aboard and things like that? And if they, if they do, um, do, do you have to feed them? You know, It really depends on where we are. Um, we'll host them to whatever endeavor they're willing to spend time with us. Most of the time, they'll, they'll make an appearance, tour the ship. Very rarely would they stay more than an hour. Um, but there, there have been occasions where they'll stay a full cruise, which then they, they act as a participant generally because on the days of our public cruises, um, to give Joe a little relief as well, at least for one of the meals, uh, the crew eats the same meal as the customers, so um, as our guests. So it's one of those things where... That's really the only time we tend to see that. We do um, facilitate events that allow outside catering to, to come in as well. Um, so you can, we do host events like any other event venue will as well. So you'll, you'll see a spectrum in that sense. Um, probably the, bit, the most consistent dignitary we saw was uh, former, the late Congresswoman Helen Bentley. Um, who who was a huge supporter of the Port of Baltimore, and by extension, a huge huge supporter of Project Liberty Ship and the SS John W. Brown. So I have to ask you, if, if you just don't feel like cooking, 
And you say, oh, I've been in the kitchen all day. You call up, like, the local pizza guy and just have, like, you know. <laughs> no, never. No. Uh, just, this I enjoy. I mean, uh, as a retiree, it gives me, gets me out of the house and gives me something to do, and I enjoy it. And yet you get to say, I've been in the kitchen all day. <laughs> and yes, I'm the first one to work in the morning and the last one at night. You know, so. yes, that, that's the secret of being a good chef. You enjoy what you're doing. So what, what's on today's menu? Uh, for dinner, we have roast beef, uh, swordfish, and uh, assorted vegetables, salad. And uh, we have a very good menu. And so I have to ask this question. If you have fish on the menu... Is any of it because you just dropped the line over the side? No, 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 no. B- yeah, we dropped the we dropped the line at BJ's. <laughs> so you catch the styrofoam wrap fish? <laughs> <laughs> no plastic wrap. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So I see we have some other people here. Yes, yeah, sir. Hey, come on down. Come on down. This is this is so. Come on in, come on in. We're, we're just rolling tape. I'm Richard Salmon from Public Radio. You are? Bill Tollefson, Staten hey, Island. Yeah. Hey, from Staten Island. Yeah. Hey, I like Staten Island. And uh, you look all official. What's your name? My name is Gil Garcia, class of 64, engine department. Wow. Class of 64. That's, that goes back a That's few days. 59 for me. All right. So, so you were aboard this vessel as a student. Yes. Wow. So, yep. so, how, did, so how did that happen? How did that happen? I wasn't do, too, doing too well in the high school that I was in on in Staten Island. And the prince, uh, the great advisor came to me and said, son, what are you going to do when you get out of school? And I said, I'm going to work on tugboats. And he said, uh, well, there's a maritime high school in New York City. You're not going to make it here. <laughs> and I le- That's encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't doing too well. I came here in my sophomore year of high school, and I was on the honor roll right through graduation. And my mother said I can come up to the city two hours traveling back and forth. And she said, if you're going to do it, you've got to work hard. You gotta, otherwise, I'm going to take you out of there. So that's why I was on the honor roll. So, so obviously you liked it. Loved it. There was, no, there was no other school in New York City to this day, and you can talk to every one of our alumni and we loved our teachers. Uh, we loved the school. We we're, were driven uh, to do the best we could. Okay. Now, did you, did, did you have a love of sea before you went to school here, or did it come after you were a student? My family's been in New York Harbor on tugboats for 125 years. Still working in the harbor. My son is working on Staten Island ferries. Oh, wow. So you're, it's in your blood. It's in my blood. Wow. My, my grandfather owned tugboats. My uncles were captains. My father was a chief engineer. I started working on freight boats in New York Harbor when I was 15 years old. I bet you lied about your age, right? Nope. No, you didn't have to in those days because you know there were rules. Of, there's rules against that now. <laughs> In 1959, my father said, you're going to go to work on a freight boat, son. Come on, you're not going to sit home all summer. And that's what I did. And I loved every minute of it. Uh, So so I guess summer camp was not an option. (laughs) No option at all. What do you do now, Bill? Yes, what do you do now? What do I do now? Who do you work with now? I'm retired now. I uh, did 30 years. I worked 30 years with Moran in New York Harbor. Left there and went to work on the Staten Island Ferries as a deckhand and terminal supervisor. All right. That's a, you, ne- you never know. What, what years were we doing the ferry? Because I may have been one of the passengers with my father. That's my father. That's Sol. That's Sol. Yes, I remember yeah. you. So, uh, 1992 to 10 years ago. I, I'm sure we were on the ferry. So we probably, we actually yeah. probably met you before today. <laughs> yeah. I lived on Staten Island all my life. I live in Annadale. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Now, and, and, and now I'm, I'm involved with the Harbor School. I get the Harbor School. I don't know if you've heard of it. You've no, no, to, tell me. Tell me. Got to go see them. This is a new maritime high school in New York City. It, they teach the environmental maritime trades from uh, Billion Oyster Project in New York Harbor. They teach uh, deck department, which we had. We're an engine department. They teach scuba diving. They teach... They have many boats. Environmental They're local. Environmental sciences. Environmental sciences. Yes. 
They have many boats that they use. They're located on, on Governor's Island. And these kids, the reason I got involved with them, I started talking with them and saw, saw how driven they were. They're just as driven as every one of our alumni. Yeah. Great school. Uh, you, know, you know, that's the, the truth. There are so many students out there that are not college material but would be much, much happier on a vocational course. They have a 80 some odd, 82 percent graduation rate, 100 percent acceptance in the college. Last year, they had five people go to CUNY Maritime. Right. Well, that's a maritime school. Yeah. 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 And that's uh, a and college. That's, though. These are all colleges. Where's the CUNY Maritime School? CUNY Maritime. Fort Schuyler. Oh yeah, Fort Schuyler in the Bronx, right on the other side of the Throgs Neck Bridge. The ship there. Yeah. All yeah. That. yeah. yeah. And that, that must be one of their training ship. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Big yeah. white. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, this is Richard Solomon. This is Take Care of Business. We're aboard the John W. Brown with some alumni. We'll be right back. You are listening to Taking Care of Business on 88.1 WCWP, WCWP.org, and TCDRadio.com. Hi, this is Richard Solomon, Taking Care of Business, and we are aboard the SS John W. Brown, a Liberty Ship. We were just talking to Bill, right? Yes. And we were talking about all the great things that you did and, 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 and what you do now. So you were talking about how great SUNY Maritime is and what a great uh, experience it is. Harbor School down in Governor's Island. That's the uh, marine environmental school. They start with oysters, and they go through deck engine and... Uh, uh, robotics, marine robotics, they have scuba diving that they, the kids are all, and all of the classes are intertied with each other for planting these uh, billion oysters in New York Harbor. That's what the whole school is uh, set up for. And I assume the oysters are going to clean up some of the, the water. That's the purpose of the oysters, yes. They, they are a filter. Right. I guess all, the, all that dirt is going to create pearls and that will create another industry. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. There's always, there's always an agenda there somewhere. <laughs> All right. Your name, sir? Bob Clancy. All right, Bob. What do you do? Uh, right now, I'm a crew member on the John W. Brown. Okay. And how did, how did that happen? <laughs> well, in uh, 1961, I walked aboard this gangway as a 14-year-old and uh, became a student here. Wow. All right. So wh what did you do as a student? Where did you go after you finished all your, your education? And, and give me all that middle stuff. Well, the middle stuff was, you know, I came here as a student, and I was being trained and planning on going to Fort Schuyler University because I grew up in Throgs Neck. And my senior year, I decided I was in enough school, and there was other up things in, in the world besides maritime. So when I left the school, my father said, okay, if you're not going to college, you get a job or go in the Navy because you're not living here. So I joined the Navy, spent 24 years in the Navy, and... Uh, when I got out of the Navy, I worked for the phone company, retired for the phone company, and now I'm home on my ship. All right. So w when you were in the Navy, what did you do? I was an interior communication electrician. And at the end of it, at my career, I uh, finished up as a command career counselor. Oh, wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. So thank you for your service on that. Thank you. So, so what do you do now aboard the vessel as a volunteer? Oh, let's see. This week I cooked um, security gangway electrician you wear a lot of hats <laughs> well we all do whatever is needed right. You know. right so you helped joe in the kitchen uh no joe took a day off so i took his place oh so you were you were joe yeah. no i uh no my wife is one of the cooks and when joe left i jumped in there and helped her with breakfast all right. so what do you like to cook what do you like to cook what do you like to eat uh, I like, yeah, <laughs> lamb, lamb, leg of lamb is my favorite food. But. Oh, wow, that sounds, that's pretty, sounds, that sounds, that sounds pretty high end gourmet, yeah. Yeah, and we've had it here already this, on this cruise. Mint jelly? Min oh, yeah. definitely oh, yeah, mint. Yeah, there you go, of course. Jelly. Look, I have to ask the questions. People want to know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can't eat lamb without mint jelly. <laughs> So do you, do you slow roast it? How do you do it? And, and how do you, do you, do you find it challenging to use the cooking equipment? Do you wish there was something else here? Or everything you need is, is basically there? Or you, or you work with what you got? 
You work with your garden. Everything we ha- we need is here. You know, you you have to do some modifications of stuff. We got two ovens. One is AC DC. Very rarely do use the DC oven. Uh, the AC oven has a grill on top, so you can grill on it if you want. Also, we also have another small grill alongside. So uh, you you adapt, and there's probably nothing here we couldn't make. Wow. So if you had to feed. A ton of people. What's the maximum amount of people you can feed at any given moment? Oh, I have no idea. I mean, we just. What's the most you've ever cooked for? Uh, roughly seventy-two people. All right, that's a lot of people. Let's put it this way: if you're making omelets, that's like about three hundred eggs right there. You know. You don't have time to count. <laughs> <laughs> I heard the chickens retired. <laughs> so you, sir. My name is Gil- Gilbert Garcia. I am a graduate of the class of 64. I got a diploma in marine uh, engineering from the John W. Brown. I came here as a 16-year-old from the Bronx. Um, what part of the Bronx? I lived in uh, Hunts Point. Because right, my father's from the Bronx. Southern Boulevard. Southern Boulevard, Boulevard Westchester Long- Avenue. Well, we were Southern Boulevard between Longwood and Intervale. You got by it. The, by got the it. libraries on yes, uh, yes, Tiffany the library Street. at Tiffany Street. Yeah. I I was uh, raised at 1015 Tiffany Street. I was born at 891 Dawson Street oh, in Dawson. the Bronx. Dawson, yeah, yes. by, by, by Dawson. By Dawson was where uh, PS60 went. My and, mother went to PS60. Uh, my my wife went to PS60, and I went to PS52. PS52. Uh, that's the intermediate. Norton, Thomas yes, Norton, I went to PS20. Where was? Simpson and uh, 167th Street. Okay, that was over the uh, where the L is on the right, other, the other side. side. Correct. Yeah, I know the area. All right. Good. Yeah. So you're okay. from the Bronx. Yes. So how does so? Do you have any history with the sea in your family, like oh, the other, yes, like yes, Bill, well, you know, my, who had has it? He has seawater in his veins. Not as much, but my father was a World War II Liberty ship sailor. And I have uh, three uncles that retired from the merchant seamen uh, service um, prior to World War II and during World War II. Did anybody actually serve on this vessel, the John W. Brown? No, unfortunately not. That would be an amazing coincidence. Except me. All right, that's cool. Um, well, you know, the students and the John W. Brown maintained this ship at my optimum efficiency, 100%. All the uh, standing and running rigging all the deck machinery, all the engine room and fire room machinery, all was operational by us students. We used to come here during the day and operate and maintain all this equipment. We used to run the main engine once a week. They disconnected the tail shaft in, in order to qualify us for a stationary uh, facility. And uh, our dream was always to one day sail the John W. Brown. And you ask all our uh, senior classes, all the alumni that come here, and that was our ultimate dream. Our ultimate dream was to one day sail on the John W. Brown. Um, Project Liberty ship uh, restored the ship, this vessel, back to its operational status. And us alum- uh, there's a group of us alumni that have been working on the ship to try and maintain it and are part of the crew. On the trip up from Baltimore, Bill, myself, Ernie, and, and uh, Bob, and Joe were part of the alumni crew of the ship and 52 years after I graduated from this ship I was able to sail my ship back under the Verrazano Bridge to the East River Drive. Now how did you feel? I mean that must have been like the woohoo! That, that, <laughs> is, that is the top of the bucket list. There is nothing else that even comes near the top of that bucket list. Um, Ernie worked on Harbor Patrol. I worked uh, as a merchant seaman, and we've been underneath the Verrazano Bridge on numerous occasions, but never have I ever had the opportunity to bring my ship back home. I hope there was thousands of photographs and video, and you know, social media and twitters. And <laughs> rest assured that we took quite a few pictures. Wow! And and do you have like a whole little you know social media thing about what that because that must have been a shining moment for yourself personally. Absolutely, absolutely. Now you, you have to realize that the skills we had the skills we had the knowledge, so we just needed the opportunity which we never got. Right. Okay, um, most of us went on to related trades. Uh, I, were, I served as a merchant seaman. I was in the U.S. Navy for four years. And I worked at Con Edison right up the street here at uh, Waterside General. The, the 14th Street Power Station? No, uh, Waterside. 
Okay, what is Thirty Ninth Street. Okay, Thirty Ninth. Yeah. Okay. And um, and then I went on to work with the Department of Education, where I retired after twenty seven years of service as a deputy director of facilities. And every one of my challenges, everything that I faced throughout my career, I've been a stationary engineer now for 42 years and a, and, a, and a refrigeration engineer. And everything that I learned here was the basis for what I learned and helped me with my career for the rest of my life. Vocational high school education is the best. Right. So, yeah. My father says, been saying that forever. All right, Ernie. You're Ernie? I'm Ernie. All right, hey, Ernie. Richard Solomon. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your uh, so anyway, so, so tell me about your, your connection. My connection at present is I'm, I'm part of the uh, deck department on the uh, John W. Brown. I've been involved uh, with PLS uh, when it started in New York, and then it went to uh, Baltimore. And I've been involved with this ship, oh, I would say since 98, 98 up to present. Oh, wow. All right. So... Tell me about all the years prior. What was that like, and how did that lead up to that moment? Years prior, let's see, as, as a junior high school student, we were going out to high school. I lived in the Bronx. Oh, no, the Bronx guy. Bronx guy. <laughs> so I where did you live? I was in the northern part of the Bronx. Gil was from the southern, southern yeah, my, Bronx. My father's from the southern yeah. Bronx, yeah. Okay, so you two southerners can get together, <laughs> and this northerner will be where he is. Uh, one, of my, one of my friends said, Let's go to uh, Metropolitan. I said, what's Metropolitan? You know, and he said, it's a ship. I said, what do you mean a ship? Never heard of it. So I said, okay, I'll go too. And the next thing it was basically, you had to be interviewed before you could even be accepted to the school. Went down for the interview, we were accepted, we came down, and here I am like a 15 year old, and I remember going down, it was like, the first time coming across the walkway at 25th Street and East River, looking up, and here is this big ship. I mean, we were, like, stunned and went aboard, and it was, like, really, really, like, taken back in time. It was something that we really wanted to do because, as Bill and everybody else, been involved around the water, in the water, over the water, under the water, and the thing there was, like, this is an opportunity, and it really was. And then as students, we were basically treated as young men because the instructors were merchant marine captains, officers. They treated you like young men. They didn't treat you like a, a freshman or a, or a sophomore in, in high school. In other words, basically, you got the respect, you earned it, and uh, the discipline was there. And you kind of like grew through the high school, you know, on the ship and as men. And uh, let me tell you, the, the years I spent on here, you can still hear the love that I still have for the ship. Oh, yeah. And basically the people that were here, like, like the alumni. I mean, a different year from each one. But there's a certain thing, as Gil said, my ship and uh, yeah. after, after I left the high school I went into the Coast Guard I spent five years in the Coast Guard and then after the Coast Guard where were you stationed? I was stationed at Staten Island I was aboard weather cutters so we used to go out for a month in the North Atlantic and come back in and go back out for a month and then after that uh, I turned and I became a, a bridge painter for a while I drove fuel trucks for a while and then I went to the New York City Police Department, and I did that for 30 years. And the first 10 years, I was a tactical patrol, and the next 20 years, I was with the Marine Division. So it was always around or near water. Well, that makes perfect sense to be in the Marine Division. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean... And, and the thing there, too, is I had lost contact with the ship. I didn't know where it was. Didn't know what happened to it. And there was no Google at the time. There was no, <laughs> there, there was no Google. I knew it was on the west side, and uh, I, I never worked that boat, police boat, uh, that passed the ship. Otherwise, I probably would have been aboard every day. Uh, just to check it out, make sure it had its papers and life jackets. <laughs> and the thing there was like, when I found out that the ship was being 
recommissioned, rededicated in 88 down in Baltimore. I worked that night, and I spent five hours driving down to Baltimore. I was all excited and everything else. Oh, I'm going back to see my ship, okay? And we got aboard. Uh, of course, the color was different. It was gray, but it still was the ship. And the, what was the original color? The original color was basically a blue. I'm uh, not blue. I'm sorry. Blue was the police boat. That get yeah. me confused. <laughs> uh, a black and white and okay. buff. And basically, so from there it was uh, involved, like from '98 on. Wow. And again, the, the the love for the ship, it's it's there. It, it it doesn't go away. And you can see that, like I said, from the alumni. Plus, the love for the crew that's aboard. You know, uh, thank God for Baltimore and taking the ship and redoing it and getting it to sail, because otherwise it would been part of a reef somewhere but it's, it's or, or part of some like a car <laughs> you know? or if you use razor blades you know yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. sure you do <laughs> and it would be part of razor blades but the thing there is basically it's 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 part of our history number one and, and number two it's part of our lives it's it's what made us what we are today you know the core has to be there, and once the core is there... It never goes away. It never goes away, and the ship builds on it. And as I was saying before, the people from Baltimore that worked this ship, got the ship back together again, uh, past and present, because unfortunately we have a lot of World War II veterans and, and they're passing on, and good individuals, they really are. So hopefully the ship will be here for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the dedication and the love that's here... You know, it will. It definitely will. Well, we're going to get the word out on public radio for you. Uh, that sounds good. Right. The public in New York and the public in Baltimore. There you go. All right. Well, thank you for your service and thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for your time with me today. Thank you much.